God, you truly are great and worthy to be praised. Your word says that the, the earth cries out and, and really directs us to yourself as we look around at the, the vastness of everything around us and we look at the sky and they continue to find deeper and deeper and deeper levels of the sky and it was all spoken into place by you. And we just pray that we would truly truly, truly celebrate your greatness and your splendor as you put this earth together, this this uh, world in such a way that it, that it continues to function because of all of your great detail. I pray that as we continue to share this time in worship, that you would speak to our heart, that you would direct our thoughts, and that your spirit would move in this place in a mighty way. We love you. We thank you for all you do. We give you praise. For it's in the master's name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Children can make their way to the junior church or children's church. And Bob is going to come and share the scripture this morning. And just before our scripture reading, um, do you remember, I have a question, uh, have you done your homework assignment from last Sunday? Some of you weren't here to get your homework, homework assignment, but let me remind you then, Pastor Kent asked us to complete this sentence, I have the privilege of serving God as a blank. So what this is, uh, it's our personal experience. He's talking about our testimony, of course. And uh, I asked Darlene, did you do your homework? She said, oh, yes, yep, I did my homework. And, well, I was talking to my mom on the phone. And anyway, she's always on top of things like that. I don't know. <laughs> so... It, it's about how our personal experience about how God is working in our life. It's not a theological thing. It's our own story. It's, um, let's see, it, it's a loving story that sparks Jesus' love in, in others. So in our reading this morning, the Apostle Paul He's uh, setting forth the earliest confession of faith as an affirmation. An affirmation is something that we speak out. So we, we confess with our mouth this, and it's Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is alive. He's working in our lives our Lord and Savior. And then, and then a reminder of where um, the statement arises from. It, it comes from our heart. And the heart is the seat of emotion and affection. Yes, it is. But it's also, it's also our intellect and our will or soul, in other words. And, uh, it obtains salvation and eternal life, the gift of God for us. So, praise God. And Paul, he's setting out in, in the scripture, he says, salvation involves an inward belief with your heart as well as an outward confession with your mouth. And then he states there's the conditions necessary for this to happen, to call on Christ to be saved. So number one, a preacher, a person uh, tells you the message. Number two, that message, of course, is proclaimed. And three, hearing. And four, believing the message. You probably heard the uh, term Romans Road. And that's what uh, several um, portions of Romans, one of which is the one we're going to read here out of Romans chapter 10. So 
It gives the directions of the destination that we're headed for. Our destination that's of faith that we proclaim. And um, that way we can love Jesus into people because it sticks. That's what Pastor Ken told us last week. And so let's look at this beautiful passage from Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 9. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Lord, as we follow after you, Lord, we give you thanks for the path that you've made for us to follow in all of its satisfactions that come, Lord. It's precious. Remember that we've all, we remember we've all got a gift that we can help to proclaim your word to those who we meet. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for that. Thank you, Bob. have another before I jump into the message, just another area of prayer for you. Um, found out last night, my mom, for those that don't know, has dementia, is in a nursing home down by Saginaw. And um, we found out yesterday that she um, tested positive for COVID. And um, the day before that, my daughter from up here and my daughter down there had both went to visit. My oldest daughter, it's her birthday was this last week, so we were going to leave right after church to go to their house and take her out to dinner. Well, we just found out that now my granddaughter that they're with them has a 104 temperature and isn't feeling well, and we're so we just got word that Alicia says, don't come down here. So a um, little disappointing to find that out just before you get up to preach because I was looking forward to going and seeing our daughter. And, but um, keep my mom and the girls in your prayers at this point, if that's what they've ended up with as well. So, um, certainly. Would you like to lead us? I'm going to try to preach with a cough drop in my mouth today, so I apologize for that already. As you notice when I was singing, my voice is not where it should be, but I'm on the mend. I didn't have COVID. I did have a cold last week, and, um, and I'm on the way back from that. So, um, Actually, can we play the video? I think I have a video there for us to...
for those that are just visiting with us today or weren't here maybe the last few weeks, uh, we've started and actually are wrapping up today um, a series entitled um, Making God Known. We've talked about in the past this statement that our responsibility as believers, as Christians, is to know God and to make him known. So we spent the last year and a half in messages really trying to understand and get to know God. And we've only scratched the surface because God is so great and, and infinite, and it's hard to, to be able to grasp a hold of all of his qualities. And yet, we needed to spend some time on what it means to make him known. And um, we talked about who's supposed to be evangelizing and what we're supposed to be saying and how we're supposed to be doing that. And we're going to finish off today with talking about why. So you saw the, the video. What, what that video was talking about is after Jesus' crucifixion and, it, and during his, the time of his resurrection, people were waiting, trying to figure out and trying to understand what was going on. There were a couple of men, Cephas and another. We don't know the name of the other. But um, they had been in town through all of this process and and they were kind of discouraged and walking away because this what they thought the savior that was going to come and and overthrow the roman government and and take over and have christianity take over had just been nailed to a cross and just died and and they hadn't even really grasped a hold of and understood the fact that the scriptures had said that this was going to happen and on the third day he would rise again so they're walking back to their town of um, down the Emmaus Road, back to Emmaus, and um, someone comes and starts walking with them. And they kind of start complaining to that person because he's like, hey, what are you guys so bummed out about? What's going on? What are you struggling so much with? And they're like, well, we were following this Jesus, and they, they just killed him on a cross, and he was supposed to be the, the Savior, and and he was going to free us from Roman rule and all of that kind of stuff. And, and this man begins to talk with them and discuss scriptures, as it mentioned in the video, that, that he began to kind of declare what really was going to happen and was supposed to happen. And they get to their home in Emmaus, and they invite him in, and, and he sits down at the table with them and breaks bread with them. And they realize at that point that it was Jesus himself that was walking with them. And as quickly as he appeared to them, he disappeared. And the scripture goes on to say that they were so excited about what they had seen that they got up from their table. Now understand, they were stopping because it was dark now, and they invited him in. They're like, hey, it's dark. You don't need to be traveling after dark. Come in and have dinner with us. Stay the night. And when this all happened, it says that they immediately got up and ran back to Jerusalem to tell the others what they had just experienced and what they had seen. They were so excited to find out the truth and to be able to have that for themselves, they dropped everything to go tell all of the disciples and everyone else they knew what had just happened. So my question for you to start out with, are you exci that excited about the things of God? Are you that excited about when he works in your life that you're letting other people know about that and and letting them hear what is taking place. The question we grapple with is why do we have to evangelize? Why do we have to do it? We've got the Bible. If anybody wants to hear about Jesus, they can read the Bible and, and you know, they can go to BAM or wherever and, and buy them one of them and, and they can get to know about him. Why do I have to be the one to tell them? Why do we have to do it? But when we look in this portion of scriptures in Romans, I want us to really kind of focus in on verse 14. And it says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? 
So you think about those two statements, and we live in a, in a place where we pretty much feel like if anybody is alive in our area, in, even in the United States, that they have surely heard about Jesus. So why is it our responsibility? And, and yet we just can't take for granted that everybody has heard what they need to hear. Now we've just gone through the last three weeks something that's been pretty much unprecedented for our society when everyone we talked about sitting and watching football games this afternoon and relaxing. For those of you who remember a few weeks ago, you were sitting and watching the football game. Someone took a hit that was pretty much just a normal hit. And I'm sure you've probably all seen the replays of it. This gentleman stands up and then collapses and has basically his heart stops right on the field. And immediately, we had announcers that were blown away by what was going on. We had announcers that on, like, regular television, national TV, were stopping and saying, please keep this man in your thoughts and your prayers. Keep th his family in your thoughts and your prayers. And, and we heard more about praying on national TV than we had heard since they were attacking Tim Tebow for getting down on one knee and praying to God before a football game or thanking God after a football game. And for those of you that aren't football people, you say, I don't know anything that you're talking about. I don't understand this. But um, Tim Tebow was basically chastised and criticized and forced out of the NFL for his belief in God. And then we turn around, and in a moment, and I'm not saying it was a bad thing. It was a great thing that people turned around and recognized that we needed to call out to God. So we live in an area where, even on national TV, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, whatever it was now, people heard about at least praying to God. Sad part is, some of them were praying to a, probably a different God than what I was praying to. But they were praying to their God. So how can they call on the one in whom they do not believe and have not believed? How can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Here's what a lot of our minds go to. We read that and we say, it's the preacher's responsibility to let people know. So here I am standing in front of you as the preacher, and, and it's our responsibility. We're the ones that are supposed to let everybody know. And believe me, I do all I can to let people know about Jesus. But it's not just my responsibility. I looked up the, the term preacher in the Greek, and here's, here's the, the definition that it, it came out with. To herald a public proclamation, to publish, and to proclaim openly. So we hear the word preach, and we tag it to a preacher but the word preach here isn't tagging it to a preacher it's not saying that a preacher needs to tell people it's saying that we need to herald to make a declaration to make a public proclamation to publish or proclaim openly remember last week I told you I I have Facebook I don't care for Facebook I don't like all the ads that come on I'm usually deleting more ads than anything else on there and, and reporting them because I think many of them are vulgar and shouldn't even be on there. But I keep it because I want to proclaim God's Word. So daily in my devotions, when I have my key scripture, I post that scripture every day. I'm not on Facebook, you know, complaining and doing all the other stuff. I'm just using it to declare, to publish the things of God, that people might see them and at least be um, pricked or prodded 
that they might have a, a desire to hear more about the Word of God. And how can anyone preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. What is good news? That's what the word gospel stands for. Good news. So we're to bring the gospel. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. It's for all of us to uh, be able to go out and share uh, the things that God has done for me. That's why we had the assignment last week. Bob, thank you for reminding me about that. It had kind of slipped through the, the cockles of my memory. But I'd ask you to take an opportunity and write out your testimony. And really the essence of a testimony is your story. How did you begin your life? When were you introduced to God? And then what has he done for you since then? That's a testimony. It doesn't have to be um, deep with all of these scriptures in it and everything else. It's your story. What's happened to you? I've shared with you through my messages uh, you pieces of my story all throughout. I grew up in a home that didn't go to church. At the age of five or six years old, an elderly couple stopped at our house and asked if they could take me and my siblings to church with them, to Sunday school. My parents said, sure. So we started going to Sunday school. Throughout my life in school, I kind of played both sides of the fence. I, I know my my sleek physique does not show it now, but I played sports all the way through school. Sports were the most important thing to me. Jesus wasn't. But I played like he was at church, but I didn't play like he was at school. I hung around with some pretty nasty guys at times. I, I went through my time of smoking pot and drinking and doing all that, all while going to church, mind you, but I didn't do it on Sundays. Um, so I went through that whole thing until I w got persuaded to go to a youth group one night and went to youth group and we were playing football in the backyard. It was a Halloween party and some girl kicked me. She karate chopped me in the middle of playing football. I don't know what she was doing. Um, but it worked because I began to start to have feelings for her and, and here I am now 40 some years later, 43 years later, uh, married to that person. But so young people look out when you get kicked. But in the midst of that, meeting her and starting to get more serious then about things at church, I went to a concert. I've shared before it was a truth concert. At the end of the concert, they said, anybody wants to come to know Jesus and, and devote their life to him, come forward. And man, without my hiney was out of that seat before I even was able to respond myself. Went forward, received the Lord. Um, I probably prayed the prayer before, but it stuck that time. And it stuck to the point where I was at the place where in verse 10, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. I had a lot of people to ask me, Pastor, what power is there in a prayer that saves people? And I look them back in the eye and I said, there's absolutely zero power in a prayer that somebody lifts up to the Lord to get saved because salvation is a gift typically when I have someone come forward to pray to receive Jesus they've already made that decision before they came up and then they profess it afterwards I remember Bonnie's dad um was in the hospital and had heart attacks and and Bonnie's family did grow up going to church with her mom but her dad never really went because 
he thought the church was very legalistic. And guess what? Back in the 60s and 70s, the church was very legalistic. Like, I grew up in a Wesleyan church. You couldn't play cards. You couldn't play pool because all of those things happened in bad places. You didn't do that. You couldn't go to dances. You couldn't do any of those things. You couldn't wear wedding rings. My father-in-law was not happy with the fact that the church told his wife that she couldn't wear a wedding ring that he had given her and pledged his faith to her. So he struggled with that for a lot of years. He's now in his 70s, 60s. He's in the hospital and had a heart attack. The pastor came in and he shared the gospel with her dad and told him that he wasn't serving the church, that he was to serve God. And her dad received Christ that day. And the reason we know that is because after that happened, Bonnie gets a phone call, and her nickname was Saba, Saba Sue. Sue was her middle name. That was her dad's nickname for her. And he called her up and said, Saba, I need to tell you, I just asked Jesus into my heart. So he, he believed in his heart, and then he professed with his mouth that he was saved. And um, she got to experience that in, in her dad when he was in his 60s. And he started then going to church and, and being a little bit more involved in that. But it, it's all of our responsibility to make Christ known to people. I shared last week when... When our team wins the game, like we're we're ready to proclaim that. I know a lot of you are probably not super cross people, but I, I actually tried to stay awake last night to watch the super cross and and root for my man Eli Tomac, E T three, and um, I fell asleep. But when I woke up I opened my phone and guess what? I found out that he had won because a lot of people were excited. And they were making sure that they got that out on Facebook and everything. Eli Tomac won race number two. He's going for it all the way. And, and Jet Lawrence won the 250s. And, and he won last week. Everybody was proclaiming that and excited about that. Which is fun and, and cool, but how often are we proclaiming that Jesus is doing a work in our life? I've shared with you a good friend of mine, David Kessler, found out about a year and a half ago that he was going into uh, renal fa failure, kidney failure, ended up now for the last year on um, dialysis and only about 9% function of his kidneys and has been an awaiting and anticipating uh, transplant and as I followed his story, he started a YouTube channel and he began to share what God was doing for him in the midst of this whole battle and this struggle. Trying to help people to understand that just because things are going terribly does not mean that God is not there. So he was pro trying to proclaim. He was trying to let people know, hey, you know what? There are days where I just want to give up, and I don't, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. And there are days where I, I, I'm really up and going. So he shared this journey, and yet Jesus was always the center focus of it. Um, fast forward, this week, he is now going in for his kidney transplant and in the midst of it still praising God for it and even through the struggles and everything else how God is faithful to show you how faithful God is he had a, a cousin a wife his wife's cousin that volunteered to give a kidney and in the midst of doing that and all the testing that took place it ends up that that cousin was a match but in the process of the testing they found that that cousin matched someone else better and the someone else 
that was going to give them a kidney, their kidney matched Dave's better. So in the process of this transplant, for, this, for it to be successful, Dave's donor is now giving their kidney to a person they don't even know. The person Dave doesn't even know is giving their kidney to him because they were just all in the process. And um, so he's been giving updates of how faithful God has been through this process to be able to help him to get the very best that was available for his situation. So when God works in our lives, we, we are supposed to let people know what Jesus is doing. And that's really called evangelism. That's making God known. It's knowing him and making him known. So how many here can sit and say, there, there have been times that God has been so faithful in my life that I've seen him move in such powerful ways that there's no denying the fact that he moved. And if that's happened, then have we been very vocal about letting other people know what Jesus has done, what God has done? Um, we should be. Luke 15, 7 says, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. In other words, there's a celebration in heaven that takes place every time a, a person is brought to Christ. And I know for me, one of the, some of the most powerful opportunities I've had have not been standing in front of a congregation preaching a message. It's been kneeling down with someone or, or putting my arm around someone that didn't know Jesus, that I had opportunity to, to introduce them to him and had them speak the words, can you lead me to him? Can you show me what I need to do? Can you help me in that path? And then to have, excuse me, <coughs> to have the opportunity then to not only introduce them to Jesus, but then have the opportunity to disciple them, to teach me about what, to teach them about what that means. And a lot of times we fail at that. We introduce them and then we're like, there. We kind of throw them in the deep end of the pool and say, there you go. Sink or swim, see how you do. And instead of continuing with them and saying, this is who Jesus is. This is what he wants to do in your life. This is how he wants to direct you. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings, the sal that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Romans 10.17, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of God. We live in a society where there are a lot of different um, beliefs. And there are a lot of people that believe there are many ways to get to heaven and that there are many ways to get to God. And yet, when you read scriptures, remember when we studied about knowing God, we talked about He is the one true God. He is the only capital G God. All the other gods that are followed and sought after are lowercase g gods. And they do not have the power to even be able to offer us anything after this life. It's only God himself. So I pray, as I wrap up the series, that we at least are mindful of the fact that we are representatives of God as believers. Christian means little Christ. That's what it means. So as Christians, we are little Christ. In Ephesians, it tells us to be imitators of Christ's love. So we are to be about Im imitating his love, loving people, not because they deserve it, not because... Um, they have earned it or bought it or anything that we are giving Christ's love unconditionally because Christ has loved us 
to the point of giving up his life, dying on a cross, raising again on the third day, making himself available to over 500 people in the 40 days following his, his resurrection before he then um, was transfigured or went up into heaven. We were studying that this last week in the book of Acts that Luke was talking about that last time that they saw Jesus and they stood on the hill and watched him go into heaven and to sit at the right hand of God. And a couple of angels came up to him and asked him why they were still staring up into heaven. And they're kind of like, well, he said he was going to return. So they were literally standing there as he went away, standing there waiting for him to come back. And the angel says, no, no need for you to stay here and watch. Now take what he's given you to all that you come in contact with. He will return one day, and here we are 2,022 years later, 23 years later, still waiting for him to come back. And it could be tomorrow, could be today, it could be another 2,000 years. But we need to continue to live as if we need to let everybody we know know about him so that they will have the opportunity to choose go to heaven. Remember, God don't send people to hell. He don't send them there. It's his desire, as it says in John 3.16, that for God so loved the world that whosoever would believe in him would not perish. God wants all to experience heaven. But it's up to us to seek him, to follow him, to devote our lives to making him known to know him and to make him known. And we need to strive to be able to do that. So get your testimony written out. I think Bonnie, for the ladies in the Bible study, handed out a, a little guideline to be able to do that as well. I know that Kate has talked about wanting to put together a booklet of everybody's testimonies from the church that you can go through and read everyone's testimony. Um, again, it's your story of where you were before God, how you met God, and then what he's done for you since. Um, I know for me, I didn't seek to be a pastor. It was not something that I grew up saying, boy, one day I'm going to be a pastor. You know, God came along and kind of blindsided me and said, this is what I want you to do. And I, like Moses, said, I can't talk, I can't sing. I can't do any of those things. So surely you've made a mistake. And he said, no, nope, surely I haven't. You will speak for me. You will sing for me. You will live your life for me. And you're going to do it with joy. And I can say now, at 61, going on 62 years old, that that decision I made at 17 after being kicked by this person it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me because I was going in the opposite direction I don't know where I would have been had the Lord not got a hold of me so um, I pray that you have a story like that as well Lord we thank you for who you are we thank you for your great love for us that as we sang a couple weeks ago, the song Reckless Love, how, how you are willing to leave the 99 to go after the one. And I know that I was one that you were going after, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the life that you've given me since then. I'm thankful for the people that you've put in my life and have given me an opportunity to speak into their lives, to to lead them into a relationship with you. And I look forward to the day that when I do take my last breath here, I stand before you and I hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in today. Lord, I pray that for my friends and family here today, that they too would strive for that kind of life that they devote themselves 
to being all that you would have him to be. Maybe not as a preacher. Again, we have the opportunity, the privilege, to be a follower of Christ and to be school teachers, or a follower of Christ and being a nurse, or a follower of Christ being um, a janitor, or um, whatever our livelihood is. We can allow you to guide and direct us in the midst of that and put you first in all of it. Bless your people, we pray. Go with us as we go from here, and we give you praise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.